Hello, everyone. Welcome to the I Care South uh, Leadership from Chinese Young Ophthalmologist Session. I'm Helen Yan from the uh, Haven Group, China, and I will host this session today. So first, uh, I'd like to express my great uh, congratulations to Medimize um, of organizing such a wonderful and successful event. So I also would like to thank the organizer to provide such a uh, great opportunity to Chinese young ophthalmologists to show to the world what they are doing and what they have achieved. So today we will have four speakers from China. So including myself, uh, after we four speak, we will leave some time for a Q and A. So you are welcome to raise your questions during our talk. So now uh, let me uh, briefly introduce myself a little bit. So my name is uh, Chung Hong Yan, and you can call me Helen. So I, I'm the director of the public health school of her university, and also the director of the social responsibility department of Her Vision Group China. So currently I'm a PhD candidate in uh, Queen's University, Belfast. So today um, I would like to share with you about China, China's National Training Center for the Prevention of Blindness. So as you can see that uh, in China, we have um, very like of, uh, human resources for eye health. So this uh, chart shows uh, released by the IPB in 2017. So comparing with the other develop, developed countries like uh, um, Singapore, Japan, and the States, we have uh, uh, huge gap, human resources in eye health. So you can also say that in China, we have an even distribution for eye health um, human resources. So most uh, human resources uh, the, like uh, they are in uh, the, the Eastern part of China, especially in the coastline cities, but in the Western part of China, there are a lot, uh, there are huge gap for, for the eye health professionals. And also uh, in China, there are several prob problems in uh, eye care professionals. So most of the, uh, the st students, the graduates from the medical schools, they just uh, learned uh, the uh, serious uh, knowledges, but not the practical skills. So after the graduation from the, the, the schools, from the universities, they don't, they couldn't master, master the, practical skills and they couldn't do pra practices immediately. So, and also, as you know, in China, there are um, like uh, about 70% or more than 70% of people they are living in the rural areas, in remote areas. And most of the, the, the county level hospitals and the township hospitals, they don't have like uh, eye care professionals. And even though they don't have uh, the eye department, so most of them they only have the like ENT general doctors. They don't have the cataract surgeons. That means the patients they living in the rural areas. They need to go to the big cities, the city centers, to accept the eye care services and also the like the, the basic uh, surgeries like in cataract surgeries. And also in China, we are like for optometries and the refraction. And um, they have the different, very different uh, education background, and they need to learn more practical uh, skills, but they don't have uh, uh, enough knowledge in eye health. So we need to train them for eye, eye knowledge. And the last problem is, is for the public health workers in China. There is there are a lot of public health workers, but most of them, they don't have the knowledges of eye health. And also they don't have the enough knowledge of management skills. So based on the current the situation and the problems we have, the Chinese central government, uh, uh, Ministry of Health, they uh, approved uh, a first uh, Chinese National Training Center for Prevention of Blindness in 2012. 
So now this training center has already established for more than 10 years, or oh, nearly 10 years. So this is the first national training center. This is a milestone for the eye health personnel's training in Chinese in China. So this training center was located uh, in Shenyang, which is the, the Hervian group located. And also the series was taught in the He University, which is one part of the Hervian group. And also the practical uh, uh, skills uh, we choose the He Eye Hospitals because we have more than 30 eye hospitals in the whole country. And this training center was led by the China central government. So um, at the time, uh, during uh, 2013 to 2015, we have Dr. Chen Zhu and Dr. Zhang Mao, who is the Minister for Ministry of Health, visited her eye hospital for several times to give our suggestions and the comments to how to provide the more qualified uh, trainings to the trainees for eye health. And not only uh, uh, get the support from the government, but also we got great support from NGOs. And the NGOs is not only in, uh, in China, but also a lot of INGOs like uh, Orbis International, uh, Fred Hollows Foundation, Lens Club on the one side, and also the World Diabetes Foundation, and also Help Me See. So, um, Based on their great support, we can provide several uh, components, several uh, uh, skills uh, of the uh, eye health trainings. And also, uh, Her Eye Hospital, we are the ICO approved uh, training center. That means we are not only can providing the tra trainings for uh, within the country, but also we can provide the, the different levels like sub subspecialty trainings for the all of the for, for the trainees from all of the world because Dr. Wei He was the uh, who who is the founder and the president of Hebrew Group was the ICO board of trustee member from 2018 to 2020 and uh, uh, from this year he was elected as the founding mem board member of ophthalmology foundation and also. Uh, this training center was approved by Ophthalmology Foundation. We can provide the different levels sub subspecialty trainings for uh, all the trainees from all from the other countries. And as you can see, we have the different uh, parts, different components of the trainings, uh, including uh, like the skills, uh, uh, surgical skills training, and also the management skills training. So we divided uh, this training for two parts, two main parts. So first part is the, we uh, named it cataract surgery teams training. So in this tra uh, training part, we uh, provide the training for the uh, cataract surgeons and op operation theater uh, nurses training, uh, and also the screening personnel training and uh, project managers training as well. Um, the second part is the refractive error team. So the, this team will provide the uh, uh, optation training and the refractionist training and also shop manager training. So in the cataract uh, uh, training team uh, uh, for the cataract surgeon training, we uh, divided into four parts. Uh, first part is the vet lab training. Uh, also, they have the opportunities to go to the theaters and the, the clinics to do the observation, uh, to see the patients, and also they can do the uh, assistance for the surgeons to uh, uh, finish the whole surgery. And we use OSCAR assessment too by ICO. And also, we are now trying to build up the world's largest cataract surgical training center um, under the great support from Orbis International and Help Me See. In this training center, we are not only use the, uh, the common ways, but also we uh, use the high technologies uh, with the simulators. So, in use this simulator, we can shorten the training time on the vet lab, I mean the 
in the in the past we use the MOIs, but now we use the simulators. We can use this uh, to uh, to provide the training for more and more trainees in China. And for the operation theaters and nurse training, we provide them for three months standardized training, uh, just uh, along with the cataract surgeons training. So for cataract surgeons training, so after like three years um, of training, we realized that if we couldn't find enough patients for the training, that's nonsense. So, so we develop a new training course uh, called screening training. So in this training, we can provide the grassroots doctors, like not only the knowledge, but also we equip them with the, the AI-based uh, slit lamp, which can be used in the villages. And they don't need to be um, like a, a general uh, a doctors, uh, ophthalmologist, but they just only to take a picture uh, by themselves and then upload this picture to our AI system. And they can get the result immediately, like in, uh, one, two, three um, uh, uh, seconds. And then we can, we can uh, get the result that whether this patient should be referred to the upper level hospitals for the further treatment. And in this uh, team training, we, can, we also provide the management training. So for the target is the people who are working in the, like the government, and also like in the other uh, charity uh, organizations, uh, because uh, we realize that a lot of people, they are managers, they are administrators, but they don't have uh, the manager, they don't have the, the knowledge about eye health. If they don't have, the, they don't uh, realize the importance of eye health. So they will not support us to do like screenings, like the other trainings as well. So we, develop this training course for them. So, so after the training, they can, like, they can design uh, a simple or basic uh, eye care uh, programs or project uh, together with us. A second part of training is the reflective error team. So in this team, we uh, provide optician, optometry, top trees, the training. So uh, we are using our uh, university resources because in her university, we have uh, optometry uh, uh, these uh, four years and the five years uh, training courses. Apart from this, we also um, uh, uh, design like uh, short-term courses, like uh, three months or one month because in China, most of the people they are working in, uh, uh, they don't have enough time, like long-term, like uh, uh, more than uh, three months, just uh, leaving their work and to get uh, the tra training on site. So we provide the short-term trainings for them. And the second uh, training is the eye glasses dispensing training. So after this training, they can master the knowledge about how to uh, make glasses in their own optical shop, in their, their own vision centers. So apart from the skills training, uh, we also design uh, the shop management training as well. Uh, so after the, the, this uh, team training, like uh, this training can, can be one person accept this training. And after the training, they can open their own uh, vision center. They can open their uh, own uh, optical shop as well. And they can provide the pr primary eye care services for the local people. So you can see this, this trainee, uh, these trainees, they are from the uh, counties, from the township levels, uh, the organizations. And after the training, uh, like three uh, months training, they set up their own uh, optical shop in the county, in their own counties. And they can uh, sell their, their glasses uh, in the 
their shop. So in this vision center, there's not only providing like the, the, the very simple services like uh, dispensing glasses, but also they have the function of providing the primary eye health screening uh, services for the local people. So we equip them with the AI-based lid lamp and also uh, the, uh, the AI-based uh, the refractive error vision screener. Um, also, uh, we equip them, we link with them with the telemedicine system. That means that like in the uh, vision center, when they uh, take the picture, like the fungus picture, uh, or the other patient, they have the complicated uh, symptoms and they, don't, they couldn't uh, handle by themselves. They can, they can link with our international telemedicine system and our ophthalmologists can give them feedback, can give them a uh, consultation uh, on, uh, by distance. So the vision center can have the different uh, several functions. Like uh, just now I mentioned, not only the optical shop, but also they can take the fungus uh, uh, pictures for the like the, the patients who has the diabetes, and also we can provide the amblyopia training for the for the children who has the amblyopia problems, and also vision function training. So in this training center. Uh, not only for the short-term trainings, but also we can provide the subspecialty trainings as well. Uh, uh, nearly all the subspecialties for eyes, we can uh, provide them. So you can see uh, not only the trainers are not only from our group, but also we uh, invited uh, like international uh, experts uh, by the great support from from Orbis and the other NGOs. This is the residency training. So uh, we also use the, not only the on-site training, but also we have an on online lab broadcasting system. So also um, by the support from Orbis, we use subsite and the Zoom and other softwares to uh, provide the live broadcast training to all of the world trainees. So now each month we uh, provide at least two courses. So um, for the, just now it's for the, just the, uh, for the domestic uh, trainings, but apart from of them, we also provide the international trainings for the other countries. Uh, along uh, under the strategy of Belt and Road. So uh, from 2018, we provide, uh, we designed the program uh, named the Set for Africa. Uh, so uh, from 2018 to till now. So every year we organize the, the Set for Africa Eye Health Forum on China-Africa cooperation. So each year we invited uh, the like more than 10 countries uh, ministers uh, uh, of Ministry of, of Health from African, African countries and also the, uh, the president of ophthalmology society of African countries to join us, to share their ideas, to share their uh, insights of how to improve African uh, eye care services by the support from China. So this is the, this year's uh, China-Africa NTD Day and Prevention of Blinding Summit, uh, together with Orbis and also the Chi with the China National Prevention of Blindness Committee. So uh, now we uh, provide uh, the different uh, uh, trainings for different countries. And now you can see that we uh, have uh, set up the partnership uh, uh, in, uh, Pakistan, the Nigeria, and also Ethiopia already. So last year, we launched China and the Pakistan Eye Health program. So this program is 
uh, uh, get great support from the Ch Chinese uh, uh, central government uh, and also the Chinese embassy uh, support. So now we are trying to duplicate uh, the Chinese uh, training mo um, model to Pakistan, especially for the children's eye health using the AI and big data uh, based technology. So, so now uh, we would like to uh, try to uh, join hands with the other organizations, uh, not only from China, but also the NGOs and other organization, organizations from other countries to duplicate this Chinese model to the other countries. So thank you. If you have any questions, you can contact me. Thank you very much. Uh, and now uh, next, uh, let's uh, wel welcome Dr. He Xing Ru to talk about can the youth visualize the future. Uh, Dr. He Xing Ru is the director of the strategic development and uh, globalization at He Vision Group. And also he is the director of Center for Vision uh, Intelligence at He University. And the Xing Ru's research focuses on the assessment intervention development and intervention assurance in the field of blindness prevention, especially from the perspective of health policy and uh, management. Welcome, Xin Ru. Hello, everyone. I hope uh, uh, everyone's doing well, no matter where you are from or sitting at. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Xin Ru, and uh, I'm uh, I've received my education at Johns Hopkins University, focusing on uh, the research of uh, ophthalmic uh, public health, especially in uh, blindness prevention. And now I'm uh, working at Ho University uh, as the director uh, at the Center of Vision Intelligence. And today I'm very delighted to present uh, my uh, findings uh, with the title of Can the Youth Visualize the Future? And how can we approach myopia management in the new decade. And today in the next uh, about 10 to 15 minutes, I would like to go through uh, my presentation from the background and trend of myopia uh, and some of the barriers and opportunities of myopia management. And I would like to raise a, a simple uh, example of uh, how her vision group is managing myopia. So myopia in brief, I, I know the audience uh, Oh, sorry. Did I uh, did I close my? Can everyone see? Yes. Okay, great. So myopia, in brief, is a condition which a visual image comes to a focus in front of a, a retina of the eye, resulting, uh, especially in defective vision of distant objects. So, um, in brief, uh, it's just that people couldn't see clearly uh, without. Uh, without any interventions. So people, why people care about myopia? Because not only it affects people's clarity in visualizing an object and the world, what we see, but also people with high myopia have higher falls and risk of uh, uh, having glaucoma and retinal diseases. And uh, as a background, uh, since I work in the field of uh, public health, I. I do focus a lot about uh, the prevalence of myopia uh, globally. And what I would like to highlight on the left graph is the uh, prevalence of myopia estimated in a different area of the world. So in 2000, as you can see that in Asia Pacific, high income countries like Japan already has about 46% you know, of myopia. Also, other regions that have high myopia prevalence, including you know, East Asian countries and Southeast Asian countries, uh, like in Philippines, Vietnam, uh, Thailand, etc. As you can see, some astonishing number is that this percentage will increase until nearly 70% by the year of 2050, which is quite alarming. As you can see the graph on the right, um, the x-axis shows uh, different age groups of the population and the absolute number in millions of uh, 
uh, how many people will have myopia. So um, what I would like to highlight is that the number of myopes in the year of 2050 um, will reach to a, a very, very high number. Uh, also by looking at the line, including the, the, the prevalence of myopia in 2050 will reach to nearly 70% globally. Um, this is quite alarming and worries me a lot. And not only from the clinical perspective, myopia really gives a great, uh, really heavy economic burden to the countries that have a lot of myopic population. And the graph on the right, uh, sorry, on the left, as you can see, is that how many or, or how, how much of a percentage of GDP myopia will give to a country uh, or the region. So as we can see in East Asia, we saw that there's a really high prevalence of myopia and it really gives a, a huge productivity loss in nearly 150 billion US dollars in East Asia. And that equates to nearly, nearly 1.5 or 2% of a country's GDP or, or the region's GDP that's resulting from myopia. So after looking at the overall prevalence and the economic burden resulting from this nearsightedness, uh, let's take a look at the prevalence of myopia among adolescents in China. So in China, um, on the left, I mean, on the left chart is different age groups and the y-axis depicts the prevalence of myopia in percentage. Uh, so these are, I think, the 95% confidence intervals. As we can see, as people age, uh, grow older, uh, the prevalence will become higher and kind of becomes, you know, uh, stable after 18 years or older. But as you can see that in China, uh, once you go into college, uh, the population, you know, of myopia is already reaching to nearly 60%. And this number is still increasing. And if we stratify by the severity of myopia, uh, the graph on the right, as we can see, is the prevalence of high myopia. In other words, uh, among those myopic population, whoever has worse than uh, six diopters will be considered high my highly myopic. And this percentage will also increase as people age. So let's take a look at the prevalence of myopia. So this is uh, another uh, example. Uh, so just now what we saw was the prevalence, right? And on this chart on the left is the absolute number or the diopter of the refractive era as people age and grow. And the graph on the right, as we can see, what I found is quite interesting is based on this systematic review, and meta-analysis, uh, people have done a prevalence and time trend of myopia among the children and adolescents in China. We can see the squared dash is the prevalence of uh, myopia uh, after 2008, which is Beijing Olympic. And the squared dash line is uh, the number or the prevalence of myopia that was before 2008. And I was wondering, oh, why, why is this? And I was thinking, I was thinking, then that reminded me of, of this person and this product. Um, I do not have a direct evidence of saying, yes, it comes from a technology like iPhone, but undoubtedly, uh, I believe that, you know, smart devices and, and mobile, you know, smart mobile devices really changed the way of how we can change the world, but also really change the way how we, how we use our eyes. And that time of era really changed how people, the habit of how people use their eyes. And I think it has some association. I personally believe there is association between uh, the prevalence of myopia increase before and after 2008. So that raises a question. Uh, we are happy that the world is becoming more convenient and the world is really advanced with technology, but is it really good for our health and for our eyes? And that's a big question mark. And since I, I took a look at how, how time and the prevalence of myopia changed and drifted, um, 
between the technology uh, advancement, I also took a look at how COVID changed the trend of myopic progression. So this is a, a, a example paper of the progression of myopia among the school age children before and after COVID. And as you can see, what I would like to highlight is that each graph shows the, uh, the spherical equivalence or the severity or the absolute, sorry, the continuous number of uh, the power of the refraction. And the lower it gets, the more myopic uh, you know, people are. And each graph shows different age groups of this research. And as you can see uh, that within this you know, age group of 60 years old, the, the, the power of you know, spherical equivalence was kind of stable each year when they did this study uh, between 2015 and 2018, even though there is a, a downward trend. But what's astonishing is that between 2019 and 2020, uh, there's a huge drop. And what could be that, that reason? I mean, this paper kind of showed uh, COVID confinement, you know, uh, at home really, again, changed the, the habits and the way how, how, how children and adolescents use their eyes uh, because they need to do online courses, uh, MOOC, uh, as well as other ways to study at home uh, by intensively using their eyes. But what's interesting also is that among the age group of six, seven, and eight, maybe also nine, we saw this huge drop, but when you know uh, the population's age becomes more higher than ten years old, um, this number kind of you know uh, became more stable. That I would say people are less sensitive to this uh, confinement, uh, but we can see there's a it's more sensitive among those who are younger than ten years old who are more sensitive to this this intensive use of eyes uh, association with the uh, the power of their square for, spherical equivalence. Another graph, it depicts the prevalence of uh, uh, myopia. Uh, and as we can, we can see kind of similar trend that is among the younger age group, like age of six, seven, and eight, there's a, a larger increase in the prevalence of myopia, but not after um, people who are older than 10 years old. So there are a lot of, uh, you know, question marks on how we can effectively prevent and treat myopia. I mean, there are uh, chemical ways to treat myopia, like atropine eye drops. Uh, there are ways to physically uh, control for myopic uh, myopia progression, like ortho K. And there are also uh, optical uh, prevention methods, like uh, using multifocal uh, glasses or contact lenses. However, it, 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 a lot of the research was not focusing on how we should, you know, how we could conduct sustainable myopic prevention. And I think that will be the next key topics uh, in the coming decade of how we can generate a model and a sustainable models to manage myopia progression. In addition uh, to that, uh, I think there are a lot of barriers and challenges uh, in the healthcare system in order to generate and come up with a sustainable myopic management uh, system. And I often use this uh, WHO um, health system management framework, including the health governance, where uh, the policy, the public policy and the governmental uh, management and how much they could invest in in each uh, healthcare sector and field in order to manage and tackle one aspect of health issues, uh, whether there's enough human resources and awareness or the parental education in raising the awareness of managing myopia, whether there is cost-effective devices and apparatus in managing myopia, also, is there a sufficient health IT system that could efficiently manage and communicate with the parents and the children, adolescent in managing myopia? But also, is there any enough health finance or funding in order to do so to come up with this sustainable program? As well as what is the business model and healthcare delivery model in order to come up and provide a sustainable, implementable and feasible 
healthcare model in order to control for myopia. And just as an, a simple example of uh, myopia management, that is, uh, we, can, we can imagine that the traditional method is to purchase a very expensive devices, very heavy tabletop autorefractor devices and tools to conduct the screening uh, by consuming a lot of time of the doctors and optometrists, as well as school uh, teachers and students in order to do so. But uh, the example I would like to raise is what Her Vision Group is doing is to, to generate a very cost-effective, uh, a very uh, inexpensive device that have a, a nice uh, screening tube that could control for the brightness of the environment and conduct screening for the young adolescents. And the data are all connected to the cloud as well as a self-managed server so that we can track exactly which location has how much percentage of myopia and their severity. Uh, in addition, there are a lot of questionnaire uh, that also connects to each individual uh, student who have uh, what kind of treatment methods are they using and what kind of uh, uh, needs do they have uh, in order to communicate with their parents and the kids in order to generate a more sustainable and feasible myopia management program. So we also have healthcare management program that could continuously you know, provide suggestions on how should they eat, what kind of environment and their habits while they're doing their homework, and is, is there enough brightness uh, in their classrooms, and what kind of habits they should change in order to manage myopia well. As you can see, this is a smarter way, rather than just go into the schools, conduct screening, and transform the paper-based database in order to do a uh, cross-sectional analysis. But what's after that? So what Her Vision Group is doing right now is a follow-up. Uh, we put a lot of more focus on following up with after the cross-sectional study and research to truly provide the value to the parents and the kids and the school to generate solutions to manage myopia. So I think my colleagues will provide more examples and information about this model, but this is pretty much what I do. I gather a lot of data and to find intelligence and information from what we are working on right now. So in the final words, I would like to say that saving one's sight is as important as saving one's life. So we are working hard in order to finding a more sustainable and more feasible ways to come up with a sustainable management of myopia in China. And we're looking forward to sharing more information with you and collaborating with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Xinru, for your wonderful speech. Thank you so much again. So uh, now the organizing committee, they would like to show a video to all of the audience um, with some updates from China. Next, we have an update from Aura, the world's leading full service ophthalmic research organization, which is expanding into China I'm joined today by Dr. Peng Wang. Peng is Vice President and General Manager of Aura China. Welcome, Peng. Thank you so much, Matt. Uh, actually, it's my great honor to be here at, as the expo today. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, uh, Peng, tell us a little bit about yourself and your role at Aura. Sure. Um, my name is uh, Peng Wang. I'm responsible for all the clinical uh, research and also the business uh, overall in, in China. Excellent. So, you know, Peng, for those who are unfamiliar with Aura, can you provide a little background on what the company does? Uh, Aura is a world-leading CRO, uh, which we are 100% uh, dedicated to ophthalmology product development. Uh, actually, Aura has a long history. Uh, the company was founded back to 1977. So till now, we have more than 40 years experience. Um, now, the company still remains as a family-owned company. Actually, there are, there are a couple of advantages for family-owned company. For example, we extend our family culture globally. We pay attention to people. We have long-term target comparing to public companies. 
And also, we have very stable executive executive management team, uh, which actually for for me, I can easily reach out to uh, you know our executive management to get support uh, for for China. Um, and also because we have so many year experience, so till now we have supported sponsor for. 48 product approval to market till now. Oh. So it's a, it's, a, it's a lost number, you know, on one security area, right? Absolutely. And also, yeah, and also our, our vision for future is to create vision beyond what we can see and to use our company as a force for good. So in short summary, uh, actually, we, you know, we have one sentence on our company logo, uh, which I think uh, is my easier um, to remember. Yeah. The sentence is, think ophthalmology, think aura. Sounds pretty good to me. Peng, you know, we have some young ophthalmologists from China uh, joining us here at the expo. Do you have any message for them in how they might be able to help your efforts? Yeah, so first, uh, I, I'm so glad, you know, um, you know the, Chi the Chinese young ophthalmologists, uh, you know, growing fast and they're trying to catch up the global um, uh, global standards. So, so one thing uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, because we we plan to extend our side network to China. So definitely, if anyone interested to join our network. You know, more than happy. I I would like to talk with them, um, and and secondly, um, as you may know, our CMO, uh, Doctor Gus Morris, will give a speech uh, on COOC this year regarding the feasibility of clinical trial in uh, neural protection for glaucoma. So you know, if anything, any question, comments regarding this topic, also we are more than welcome to to have some further discussion afterwards. You know, the, the contract research area is, is quite vast. So could you also explain a little bit about all the different areas that Aura is into in that regard? We Aura provide a very unique broad service scope. Uh, we start from uh, discovery, um, preclinical development, and also CMC support throughout the clinical service. And all this with regulatory support from beginning to end. And secondly, we have many experts with decades experience uh, on this area from the uh, anterior segment, posterior segment, and also medical device. So many of them with medical training background. I think this is very important uh, to our sponsor. A third, as you know, for clinical trials, um, the size is critical for, for overall. So globally, uh, Aura have a side network we call AuraNet. So through AuraNet, we can definitely shorten the startup timeline and also can accelerate the patient enrollment speed. Um, lastly, Aura always emphasizes the innovation. So we have many in you know, innovation technology for study endpoints and skills can allow us to extradite the good clinical outcomes and also uh, customers' product, uh, product approval from authority globally. Well, that's fascinating. Um... Are those some reasons why perhaps uh, ophthalmic companies within China would want to be working with Aura? You know, when, when we interface with um, the, the customer um, from, from China, we can see the challenge uh, this customer face. For example, uh, the gaps in the knowledge base of ophthalmology, and understanding of regulatory, uh, regulatory challenge pathway, not only China, but also you know, US and Europe. And also there are needs for innovation. Um, 
And of course, you know, the, the timeline, the speed is very important for them, for the whole competition environment in China right now. So I think, you know, by working with a uh, customer in, in the early process, utilize, you know, the, all the resources I mentioned just now, our work can help, you know, our, our sponsor to save time, save cost, and in the end of the day, you know, gain the good clinical out outcome for their product approval. How do you think that the company's expansion into China will also drive innovation, which is a really important feature of, of our field? Uh, actually, we would like to expand our uh, global experience, exper expertise in ophthalmology area into China market, bring the true value to customers, bring the innovative product to the end medical needs for Chinese uh, patient. So to achieve this goal, uh, I believe we will through you know, a, a couple of things. Um, first, we will provide high quality data compliance with local regulatory requirement. Uh, second, uh, we will provide a specific study design uh, with innovation endpoints and, and skills. Third, as I just mentioned, globally we have a side network, RNet. So we will definitely expand RNet into China, uh, establish a trust investigators and size relationship to allow us to accelerate the study uh, timeline and also the patient movement uh, speed. And lastly, we will apply our uh, worldwide learnings to China through our Chinese in-country personnel working with our global, uh, our global teams. That's great. And uh, as you're making more inroads into China, what other stakeholders would you say are important to Aura? I think uh, a, a couple of uh, st stakeholders. Uh, first, I just mentioned, you know, investigator and size. Definitely is, is a key factor uh, for clinical trial. Secondly, uh, patient, because you know, in the end of the day, for all clinical trial, we need data from patient. So definitely, we will pay a lot of attention uh, to support patient to participate into the clinical trial. Um, third, um, for for our customer, so. I think, uh, you know, for the ophthalmology market in China, um, in previous years, uh, I see, comparing to other superior areas, there are few clinical trials for ophthalmology. But uh, within last one or two years, uh, I see many emerging biotech companies only focus on ophthalmology product development. So, uh, I, I believe this pi uh, pioneer would like to bring the you know, global innovative product into China market. So definitely, you know, Aura would like to work with them together to achieve the goals. And 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 fourth, I think, uh, you know, for for our uh, internal team, you know, definitely uh, we expand our internal resource. Uh, to work together with all these uh, stakeholders uh, within China. Well, we're so glad you could be with us today at the Expo. Um, I'm so glad that there maybe are some opportunities for some young ophthalmologists to get involved and uh, support what you're doing in China. We wish you all the best, great success, and um, enjoy the Expo. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now, um... Next, let's welcome uh, Ms. Zhang uh, Mingqi uh, to talk about the eye and stem cells, the path to treating um, blindness. So Zhang Mingqi is an associate senior researcher at uh, He Viren Group and the director of key laboratory of ophthalmic stem cell tissue engineering. She took PhD studies on stem cell and regeneration medicine. Her research focuses on stem cells and eye diseases, including the limo stem cell deficiency, retinitis, 
and age-related macular de degeneration. Welcome, Ningqi. Hold for a moment. Is it clear? Yeah, you can? Yes. Can you please. hear me? Yeah. Yes, please. OK. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank the organizer and uh, uh, congratulate them. There is a full, uh, there is a real great meeting. I'm honored to have a chance to share my topic, the eye and stem cell, the path to treating blindness. My name is Zhang Mingqi. I'm from Hebeian Group. The outline of my topic is as follows. First, I will introduce the innovation system. And the other part, I will uh, present an introduction to stem cells and how the stem cells might be treated retinal degeneration. And the beautiful scenery is from her university campus. Let's move on the first part. I will introduce the innovation system. The system was created by Dr. He Wei. And the system now has four parts. Hospital, her university research center, and the industrial platform. The system aims to provide high quality, uh, aims to provide high quality and genius and advanced technology to treat eye disease uh, from bite to bench and bike. And uh, this is the view of our research center. I'm working in this research center. The center equipped a number of equipments and the center attached important to international um, academic collaboration and exchange. Now let's move to the, uh, to the other part. I will introduce the uh, retinal degeneration. The retinal degeneration is one of the main um, cause of blindness in the world. As we know, our eyes are an important part in our body. And we cannot um, be imagine uh, without eyes uh, what will a life will be. And, uh, and the typical one for retinal uh, uh, the typical one for retinal degeneration is uh, a retinitis pigmentosa. And uh, it, it initially destroyed the retinal cells uh, that responsible for uh, prevalent vision that remain a, a, a that remain a tunnel view of the world. And another type is age-related uh, macular degeneration, is one of the leading cause of elderly um, uh, of elderly people, and uh, uh, it. And it involves uh, the destroyed uh, uh, retinal cells in the central part. And both of the diseases have in common in the loss of photoreceptors and retinitis pigmentosa epsilon cells. And there's currently uh, no effect treatment for retinal degeneration. And uh, for treatment perspective, uh, we want to do is to repair the damage, the photoreceptors, or provide nutrition uh, for the uh, for the cells. And when we talking about stem cell, we think about uh, the pluripotent. And as we know, embryonic stem cells and induced pluripotent stem cells are the most powerful and flexible stem cells. They can make any cell type in our body that you need. However, uh, there's some concerns uh, about, uh, uh, about ES and IPS cells that can lead tumors or cause genetic mutation. And another uh, cell type is adult stem cells. They can found in many tissues and organs. And uh, these cells uh, have become a less cell type uh, in our body. Uh, they have less stem cells and their fate is less flexible. And uh, the last one that actually be used in treat retinal degeneration therapy development. We call them retinal progenitor cells. 
and uh, this cells uh, and this cell their fate has been uh, determined. They can only uh, become the target cells, and uh, in our case, they can only become the retinal progenitor cells. And this cells uh, there has advantages to uh, integrate the patient existing uh, tissues. But the problem with this cells is, uh, uh, is that the cells cannot make billions and billions of uh, stem cells. And our lab is uh, working with uh, retinal progenitor cells. And we are lucky. Uh, we have established an effective method to exploit a high quality uh, retinal progenitor cells. And the picture so that the cells look very beautiful. And uh, the red color is the uh, positive one for nesting. And for, uh, for preclinical, we manufacture the cells and the GMP facility. And uh, we deliver is very simple, just by uh, in vitro uh, injection. And uh, we don't use any, uh, um, any immunosuppression. And which is uh, performed under uh, topical anesthesia. Uh, so the procedure is very easy. And we have such a preclinical study. For tumor genetic test, uh, we have transplanted the retinal progenitor cells uh, by different passengers uh, in the immunodeficiency mice. We aim to look at that whether the cells can cause tumor. And in the results, we saw that uh, in the right pictures, we saw that the retinal progenitor uh, treatment animals uh, didn't have found the uh, tumor formation. And for safety tests, our cell types are uh, pathogen free. And we also look at uh, the characosomes, and the, the characosomes uh, look very normal. And this is uh, very important for us. And we also test the function. In our lab, uh, we can uh, demonstrate that these cells can uh, differentiate into all kinds of retinal cells. And uh, the red color shows that the special markers that can express the in retinal cells. And uh, these cells can release the growth factors, uh, include EGF, GDF15, NAT4, PDGF. And these cells uh, and these markers can provide nutrition or help the process of the degeneration. And uh, for animal tests, we use RCS right, uh, which is RP model, and uh, uh, we transplanted the 0.2 million cells uh, in the jewelry of the eye, and we aim to test the safety and the efficiency. And we use electrography test uh, the function. And, and this measure has been used in clinical for RP patient. So they can uh, reply the, uh, the function. And we can see uh, in the left uh, pictures that the cell treated animal S have prominent aptitudes. And uh, the orange bar so that the aptitudes uh, has uh, uh, has significant uh, increased. And in the right pictures uh, that we can see that the cell treatment uh, animals uh, has uh, the thicker uh, in out nuclear layer of the, uh, of the retinal. And uh, the number of cell nuclear photoreceptors has increased uh, uh, very significantly. You can see in this orange bar. And this results so that photoreceptor transplantation can protect photo, uh, can protect uh, the retinal cells, and uh, the cell treated animals uh, do much better. And we have a clinical trail. And the trail and the primary object is to see the safety. And uh, we have uh, enrolled 10 patients and uh, we transplant 1 million uh, RPG cells 
the in vitro of the patients. After one year, uh, we can see the patient's virion has been proved and uh, the cell is well uh, tolerated and uh, the safety profile is good. Uh, there's no significant uh, complications. So this uh, inclusion, um, an uh, intravitreal interjection of uh, uh, human retinal progenitor cells is an effective and a safe method to delay the process of retinal degeneration, which may be where the perocreation function of transplant of human retinal progenitor cells. Thank all of you and for your support and uh, the members in our labs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mingqi. Thank you for your wonderful speech. Thank you very much. So next, let's welcome our last speaker for this session, Dr. Hu Lan, to share her experiences on myopic susceptibility gene screening in China. So Dr. Hu Lan is an associate chief physician at He Viren Group and associate professor at He University. She specializes in diagnosis and the treatment of common pediatric eye diseases such as refractive error, strabismus, amblyopia, and so on. So welcome, Dr. Hu. Uh, hi, Helen, can you hear me? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Alan Hu. I'm a pediatric ophthalmologist in Shenyanghai Hospital. And uh, I'm so happy to have this opportunity uh, to share something here. And uh, today I will focus on uh, myopic susceptibility gene uh, testing in China. So uh, as we know, the, pre uh, the, pre uh, the, pre the prevalence of myopia uh, has uh, increased these years. And uh, about one in six, uh, the world uh, population uh, uh, is myopic. Mm, in my uh, clinic, the most common disease I see uh, is a myopia too. And uh, in this picture, we can see the uh, distribution of myopia worldwide. And uh, uh, the prevalence of myopia is really high in, in East or Southeast Asia. Uh, according to the uh, white paper uh, of Chinese National Viral Health released in uh, 2016, about 700 million people uh, in China suffer from myopia. And uh, the prevalence of uh, myopia in primary school, middle school, and high school is 36%, uh, 71.6%, uh, and 81% uh, respectively. And uh, in this picture, we can see uh, the uh, myopia is developing uh, at early age. And the prevalence rate of myopia in six-year-old group uh, is about 14.5%. Uh, 14, uh, 14 so uh, so uh, it, it has increased significantly uh, uh, over about 10 years. Um, this picture shows us the uh, prevalence of myopia uh, worldwide uh, from a uh, between in 2000 and 2050, uh, it is uh, estimated that uh, in 2050, about 50% uh, of the world population will be myopic. And in them, about 10% uh, um, will have a high myopia. Uh, it will lead to um, it will lead to a sevenfold uh, increase in viral loss uh, from high myopia. Uh, we all know uh, myopia brings us uh, a lot of harms. Uh, the incidence of glaucoma, cataract, retinal detachment, and uh, myopia uh, maculo uh, maculopsy uh, is greatest uh, in individuals uh, with high myopia. Uh, from this table, we can see um, comparing, comparing to the low myopia, uh, the risk of developing uh, retinal detachment is about 5 or six times greater uh, in people with high myopia. And uh, the risk of uh, developing uh, myopia, um, macroopsy, 
uh, is about 20 times greater in people with high myopia. So the duty of uh, the eye doctors and other eye care uh, pract uh, practitioners is really heavy. Uh, the exact cause of myopia is still unknown now, but we believe it to be a mix of uh, heredity hereditary and environmental factors. Um, children, of, children of East or Southeast Asian or children uh, with two parents myopic are easy to be myopia. And uh, the progression of their myopia is faster than other children. So uh, we know uh, genetic uh, is associated with myopia. And uh, uh, environmental factories, uh, factors uh, such as uh, near work, uh, learning posture, uh, in elimination, uh, lifestyle, and nutrition are uh, also associated with myopia. Uh, the cause of myopia uh, is multifactorial. Uh, if both parents are myopic, uh, the chance of developing myopia for the kids is seven times higher. If we combine the genetic um, genetic factor of the two parents being myopic with the factor of higher education, it means too much near work, uh, uh, less time uh, spent outside, and uh, too much uh, intense uh, using their eyes. Uh, so the chances are uh, 52 times higher than for someone not having those risk factors. From this, we recognize the import, uh, important, importance of gene environment in interaction. So what's the, what's the meaning of gene environment interaction? Um, it's mean, uh, it is possible uh, you uh, inherit the ability to be a myopia. And then if you uh, lifestyles, if your lifestyle produce just the uh, right condition, you will develop it. Uh, doctors, look, uh, doctors are uh, looking at ways to slow the progression of myopia. So the effective way, uh, the current effective way with uh, uh, low dose atropine uh, or multifocal or bifocal soft lenses or ulcer uh, And some glasses uh, can also uh, prevent or control myopia, uh, such as uh, glasses with uh, modulated peripheral defocus. And uh, as uh, some doctors uh, suggest the patient to do visual training, uh, such as uh, uh, exercise of accommodative facility. Um, in, in addition of this, uh, in addition to this, uh, environmental exposures and lifestyles should be changed too. But who should pay more attention uh, on the environmental uh, exposures or uh, which eye habit should be changed first? This is how uh, gene testing can help us, can help us because different genotypes uh, can respond differentially to different environmental exposures. We divided the gene, type, uh, gene testing into two parts. One is uh, pathogenic gene testing. Uh, this is suitable for the patient who has already got a uh, high myopia, or the patient uh, has a family history with high myopia. We can uh, find the cause of his high my um, their high myopia, and we can exclude uh, some other system disease associated with high myopia. And the other part is uh, susceptibility gene testing. Uh, it is uh, it can be used widely. Um, we can analyze the patient the risk uh, with the risk uh, probability to uh, go, to get a high myopia and the doctor uh, it can help the doctor to do the uh, customized myopia control. Uh, we collected uh, the uh, the oral swab samples of four thousand and four hundred twenty seven primary school students and check 11 susceptibility gene for them. And the result saw us, 7% uh, uh, students uh, has high risk to develop high myopia, and 7% uh, 
uh, has moderate risk, and uh, six, uh, seven, 76 percent has low low risk. Low risk means the risk is lower than the general population. Moderate risk risk means the risk is not lower than the general population, maybe equal or maybe higher than than the uh, general population. High risk uh, means the risk is higher than the general population. So the doctor should pay more attention on the patient with uh, moderate or high risk. Um, uh, this graph shows us the distribution characteristic of uh, susceptibility gene load in high risk population. And uh, uh, the name of the gene and the function and the gene function uh, are listed uh, in the table on the right. We can see, we can see it. So uh, how can the gene testing help us to uh, guide uh, the prevention and uh, uh, control the myopia? Um, at first, if the patient got the moderate or high risk, uh, we, will, we, will we will prescribe uh, the more effective lenses for them, such as Osirke or the glasses with, uh, uh, with modulated peripheral defocus. And uh, uh, we also uh, suggest the doctor um, to moderate or observe the patient's eyes uh, closely, uh, such as we uh, check their uh, excellence and uh, founders every three or six years, six months. And uh, some genes are associated with the nutrition intake. Uh, if uh, the patient have, the, have some problem with the gene uh, uh, GEB2, uh, LUM or gene IGF1 or, or FGF10, uh, we will change their diet. Um, uh, we will tell them to eat um, to eat more food, contain uh, zinc, uh, Lucy, or uh, uh, vitamin A, and uh, eat less uh, sweets. If the patient with the uh, has problem with the gene MIPEP, we will tell the we will tell the patients uh, to do more exercises and uh, uh, do more. Uh, after the activities. Uh, some genes are associate, as, as, associated with eye habit. Uh, so if the patient has a problem with these genes, we will uh, change their eye habit, uh, such as we will change their learning uh, posture and, uh, told, and tell them how to uh, use the light when they're learning uh, and so on. So at last, uh, uh, I will talk about the indication of susceptibility gene testing. Uh, uh, in our hospital, we, uh, we suggest a patient, we, we suggest children with a family history of high myopia or children with parental myopia to do the um, susceptibility gene testing. And the children with more time spent reading, writing, using electronic device, devices and other near reading work activities. Children with less time spent after loss and uh, uh, children ha who, had, who has bad eye habits. And children with imbalanced uh, nutrition intake. Or children with uh, myopia early onset. And the children who want to prevent or control their myopia. Uh, for, for, um, we will uh, suggest uh, children to do the uh, susceptibility gene testing and uh, uh, we will do the cosmetics. Uh, uh, I can uh, myopia control. Uh, so I hope uh, this brief uh, presentation uh, has given you some idea about uh, the susceptibility gene testing we do in our hospital. Uh, and uh, I'm so glad I have this chance to speak here. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hu, for your wonderful speech. So now uh, we have uh, already finished all the four speakers' uh, speeches. So uh, if you have uh, any questions, please feel free to ask. I think uh, now we have already uh, run out of time for this session, but uh, it's okay if you, you have any questions. Have a wonderful Thank day. Thank you. You Thank do you. the same, have take care. Day. Bye.